Hi everybody and welcome to Tea with Jesus for this week. Oh, that's good. <laughs> we are going to now really focus in on Acts 21 and what's happening now as we continue further into um, especially what's happening in Paul's life and in his ministry as he has now come back to Jerusalem. Last week I had covered some of the uh, misconceptions, misunderstandings, lies that have been told about Paul and his ministry. Um, but this week I'm going to go ahead now back to verse 15 of Acts 21 and I'm going to go ahead and read through verse 40. After this we packed our things and left for Jerusalem. Some believers from Caesarea accompanied us, and they took us to the home of Mason, a man originally from Cyprus and one of the early believers. When we arrived, the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem welcomed us warmly. The next day, Paul went with us to meet with James, and all the elders of the Jerusalem church were present. After greeting them, Paul gave a detailed account of the things God had accomplished among the Gentiles through his ministry. After hearing this, they praised God. And then they said, You know, dear brother, how many thousands of Jews have also believed, and they all follow the law of Moses very seriously. But the Jewish believers here in Jerusalem have been told that you are teaching all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn their backs on the laws of Moses. They've heard that you teach them not to circumcise their children or follow other Jewish customs. What should we do? They will certainly hear that you have come. Here's what we want you to do. We have four men here who have completed their vow. Go with them to the temple and join them in the purification ceremony, paying for them to have their heads ritually shaved. Then everyone will know that the rumors are all false and that you yourself observe the Jewish laws. As for the Gentile believers, they should do what we already told them in a letter. They should abstain from eating food offered to idols, from consuming blood or the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. So Paul went to the temple the next day with the other men. They had already started the purification rit ritual, so he publicly announced the date when their vows would end and sacrifices would be offered for each of them. The seven days were almost ended when some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul in the temple and roused a mob against him. They grabbed him yelling, Men of Israel, help us! This is the man who preaches against our people everywhere and tells everybody to obey to disobey the Jewish laws. He speaks against the temple and even defies this holy place by bringing in Gentiles. For earlier that day they had seen him in the city with Trophimus, a Gentile from Ephesus, and they assumed Paul had taken him into the temple. The whole city was rocked by these accusations and a great riot followed. Paul was grabbed and dragged out of the temple and immediately the gates were closed behind him. As they were trying to kill him, word reached the commander of the Roman regiment that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately called out his soldiers and officers and ran down among the crowd. When the mob saw the commander and the troops coming, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander arrested him and ordered him bound with two chains. He asked the crowd who he was and what he had done. Some shouted one thing and some another. Since he couldn't find out the truth in all the uproar and confusion, he ordered that Paul be taken to the fortress. As Paul reached the stairs, the mob grew so violent that the soldiers had to lift him to their shoulders to protect him, and the crowd followed behind shouting, Kill him! Kill him! As Paul was about to be taken inside, he said to the commander, May I have a word with you? Do you know Greek? the commander asked, surprised. Aren't you the Egyptian who led a rebellion some time ago and took 4,000 members of the assassins out into the desert? No, Paul replied. I am a Jew and a citizen of Tarsus in Cilicia, which is an important city. Please let me talk to these people. The commander agreed. So Paul stood on the stairs and motioned to the people to be quiet. Soon a deep silence enveloped the crowd and he addressed them in their own language, Aramaic. So that completes the 21st chapter of Acts. And, you know, we have, as we go back and look over these passages, you know, we had talked last week about how they were confused about what he was doing or lying about him, or many people were kind of stirring everybody up. Um, there was um, 
a wide debate among a lot of the Jews uh, who had come to Jesus about what Paul was doing as he was teaching the Gentile um, people and as he was teaching the Gentile Christians. The leaders in Jerusalem, which would have been James, Jesus' half-brother, and the other leaders there um, of the Jerusalem church, um, asked him if he would just do something just to reassure the Jewish Christians that he was still wanting to honor the Jewish uh, laws and their customs. And so um, by going and purifying himself ceremonially, they, um, you know, they would maybe be reassured somewhat. These apostles, these leaders knew that these accusations against Paul were not true. And, um, you know, this decree that the Jerusalem uh, leaders had sent to the Gentiles, which we have talked about previous, previously, is still the only thing that they really, as leaders, want to require of the Gentiles. And as we looked here in verse 25, that was that they would not eat food that had been offered to idols, uh, they would not consume blood or the meat of strangled animals, and to refrain from sexual immorality. Um, if we understand the culture of the time and what happened a lot with idol worship and everything, um, we can see that these, these actions um, could have been just like too offensive. Um, you know, eating food that had been offered to an idol, um, eating you know, blood or the meat of a strangled animal. And they just knew that it was just a very good idea as the Holy Spirit led them to ask the Gentiles to also be careful to refrain from sexual immorality. And so these leaders knew that, that, um, that Paul was doing fine, but they just kind of wanted to really reassure a lot of the, um, the big population now that had come about of, of Jewish Christians, um, reassure them that Paul still, you know, still cared about their customs. And so, um, you know, he went in where some other people were finishing a vow, and he went in and joined them in the purification um, ceremony. Uh, to pay for them to have their heads ritually shaved was um, a, a way for an Israelite to associate himself with those who had taken a Nazarite vow. So to see what a Nazarite vow is, let's go to Numbers 6. And I'm going to start by reading verses 1 through 5, and then um, we will go on and read um, verses 18 through 19. Okay. gives us an idea of what these men were doing that Paul was helping to assist them with. Then the Lord said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. If any of the people, either men or women, take the special vow of a Nazarite, setting themselves apart to the Lord in a special way, they must give up wine and other alcoholic drinks. They must not use vinegar made from wine or from other alcoholic drinks. They must not drink fresh grape juice, and they must not eat grapes or raisins. As long as they are bound by their Nazarite vow, they are not allowed to eat or drink anything that comes from a grapevine, not even the grape seeds or skins. They must never cut their hair throughout the time of their vow, for they are holy and set apart for the Lord. Until the time of their vow has been fulfilled, they must let their hair grow long. And then the remainder of these verses up through uh, verse 18 is talking about, um, you know, a, a lot of the different things that they also needed to follow during a Nazarite vow. And then they would prepare sacrifices that would be taken um, when the, they were completing their vow. And so I'm going to start in verse 18. Then the Nazarites will shave their heads at the entrance of the tabernacle. They will take the hair that has been dedicated and place it on the fire beneath the peace offering sacrifice. After the Nazarite's head has been shaved, the priest will take for each of them a boiled shoulder of the ram, and he will take from the basket a cake and a wafer made without yeast. He will put these all into the Nazarite's hands. And then the Nazarite will be presenting them before the Lord. So um, these men here, you know, back in Acts, had taken a Nazarite vow, and uh, Paul becoming involved in this was a way of really showing them um, support. They would probably, in this case, have had 30 days of ritual purification and then would have their, you know, have their heads shaved. Now, what happened, however, was that um, there were some people, that, uh, some Jews, that were from the province of Asia, 
and they saw um, Paul in the temple. And he had, um, you know, been there, you know, uh, you know, going along with what the, the leaders in um, Jerusalem had asked him to do. And they saw him there. And they had apparently seen him earlier with Trophimus, who was a Gentile that had come from Ephesus with Paul. And so they had basically just assumed that Paul had actually taken him into the temple when they saw Paul there. And um, they got, of course, as we have read, really got up in arms and um, were, be before the Romans intervened, were basically pretty much trying to beat Paul to death. So these Asian Jews had made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the feast. And they had already, think about this, with everywhere he'd been traveling, they'd probably already been opposing Paul when he came to their regions. So here they're coming into Jerusalem. So they recognized Paul himself. They saw him in the temple and they were enraged. And so, you know, they just assumed that he had brought, brought Trophimus into the inner precincts. And like I said uh, last week, to bring a Gentile, Greek, Gentile, they use those words often interchangeably, to bring them into the inner temple places was very grave. Um, even a Roman citizen would not be exempt from a death penalty for that. And so um, it was a very serious offense that they were basically assuming that Paul had done. And of course, you know, they had seen him coming into their regions and re reaching out to the Gentiles, um, you know, bringing them to an understanding of Jesus um, and not requiring them to become fully Jewish in all of their customs and um, their rituals. And so they just made this assumption that here was Paul in Jerusalem, bringing a Gentile, you know, into a sacred place. And um, like I said, if the Romans hadn't stopped them, they really were on their way to, to trying to beat Paul to death. So, you know, if we, if we look here in verses, you know, 30 through 32, um, where it says, you know, this is Acts 21, 30 through 32, the whole city was rocked by these accusations and a great riot followed. Paul was grabbed, dragged out of the temple. The gates were shut behind him, making a big statement there. And as they were trying to kill him, then the word reached the commander of the Roman regiment that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately called out his soldiers and officers and ran down among the crowd. When the mob saw the commander and the troops coming, they stopped beating Paul. And, um, you know, if you think about it, um, I want to go back uh, just to take a moment to verses 4 and 11 and 12 in Acts 21. These are the words that, you know, that Paul had been hearing from different people. Um, we went ashore. This is verse 4. We went ashore found the local believers and stayed with them a week. These believers prophesied through the Holy Spirit that Paul should not go to Jerusalem. And then if we go ahead and look at verses 11 and 12, this is what Agabus, um, the prophet, had told Paul. He came over, took Paul's belt, and bound his own feet and hands with it. Then he said, the Holy Spirit declares, so shall the owner of this belt be bound by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and turned over to the Gentiles. When you heard this, we and the local believers all begged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. So, you know, the prophecy is being fulfilled here. And he is running into some serious trouble there in Jerusalem. But God really turns this around um, as he is so good about doing. Because when Paul got a chance to talk to the Romans, and they thought he was, what, a... Um, an Egyptian who had led a rebellion of like 4,000 assassins out into the desert. Yeah, poor Paul. He got called a lot of things. But um, he convinced them, the Romans, uh, to let him speak to the crowds. And so if we look here in verse 40, the commander agreed. So Paul stood on the stairs and motioned to the people to be quiet. Soon a deep silence enveloped the crowd and he addressed them in their own language, which would have very, you know, was Aramaic. Now, this has got to be God at work. This crowd had just been rioting, and they were trying to beat him as much as they could, and they were all upset, and, and um, a mob was all stirred up. But it's like God just quieted this whole situation down so that when Paul asked them to quiet down, it says a deep silence enveloped the crowd. So I want to take a little bit of time here 
And I want to just look at what Paul said to the crowd here. We're going to be in Acts 22 now, starting in verse 1. And he's going to tell them a lot about his own story. And um, you're going to see here that the reaction was not wonderful, but the truth still got out to that crowd of people. The truth is still was still going forth. And so I'm going to read through verse 23. It'll be 1 through 23. And let's just see what Paul had to say to this crowd when the Roman soldiers let him get down and turn to them. Brothers and esteemed fathers, Paul said, listen to me as I offer my defense. When they heard him speaking in their own language, the silence was even greater. Then Paul said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, and I was brought up and educated here in Jerusalem under Gamaliel. As his student, I was carefully trained in our Jewish laws and customs. I became very zealous to honor God in everything I did, just like all of you today. And I persecuted the followers of the way, hounding some to death, arresting both men and women and throwing them in prison. The high priest and the whole council of elders can testify that this is so. For I received letters from them to our Jewish brothers in Damascus, authorizing me to bring the Christians from there to Jerusalem in chains to be punished. As I was on the road approaching Damascus about noon, a very bright light from heaven suddenly shone down around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the Nazarene, the one you are persecuting. The people with me saw the light, but didn't understand the voice speaking to me. I asked, what should I do, Lord? And the Lord told me, get up and go into Damascus, and there you will be told everything you are to do. I was blinded by the intense light and had to be led by the hand to Damascus by my companions. A man named Ananias lived there. He was a godly man, deeply devoted to the law and well regarded by all the Jews of Damascus. He came and stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, regain your sight. And at that very moment, I could see. Then he told me, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and hear him speak. For you are to be his witness, telling everyone what you have seen and heard. What are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Have your sins washed away by calling on the name of the Lord. After I returned to Jerusalem, I was praying in the temple and fell into a trance. I saw a vision of Jesus saying to me, hurry, leave Jerusalem, for the people here won't accept your testimony about me. But Lord, I argued, they certainly know that in every synagogue, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And I was in complete agreement when your witness Stephen was killed. I stood by and kept the coats they took off when they stoned him. But the Lord said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. The crowd listened until Paul said that word. Then they all began to shout, Away with such a fellow! He isn't fit to live! They yelled, threw off their coats, and tossed handfuls of dust into the air. So here he really had an opportunity to give his testimony of how he turned from being a great persecutor of Christians to being a great leader of the Christians. And it, sound, it looks like everybody was listening pretty well until he said that the Lord wanted him to go and, and minister and bring the gospel to the Gentiles. And then they got all riled back up again. And apparently very angry and they're tossing dust into the air and ripping off their coats. And um, yeah, very, very angry at him. But, you know, we have to realize that this was, once again, a chance for Paul to give a really amazing testimony to this group of people. And who knows, you know, ultimately what the result of that is going to be in some of those lives there. So even though Paul knew very well by prophecy that he was going to run into big problems in Jerusalem, he felt led of the Lord to go there. And God is going to work even out of these difficulties 
to still bring the good news to people. And I think Paul really knew that and, and believed it in his heart that God was going to continue to work through him as long as he had breath in his body, the Lord would speak through him. Now Paul mentioned here that he had been taught by Gamaliel. And we have heard from Gamaliel before because he was the one that you know, spoke up um, when the um, Jewish leaders were trying at the very beginning, right at, right at Pentecost time, trying to figure out what were they going to do about this growing movement following Jesus. So let's go to Acts 5 and we're going to read 34 through 39 just to hear what Gamaliel had said. But one member, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, who was an expert in religious law and respected by all the people, stood up and ordered that the men be sent outside the council chamber for a while. These are the men that they're accusing. Then he said to his colleagues, men of Israel, take care what you're planning to do to these men. Some time ago, there was that fellow, Thutis, who pretended to be someone great. About 400 others joined him, but he was killed, and all his followers went their various ways. The whole movement came to nothing. After him, at the time of the census, there was Judas of Galilee. He got people to follow him, but he was killed too, and all his followers were scattered. So my advice is, leave these men alone. Let them go. If they are planning and doing these things merely on their own, it will soon be overthrown. But if it is from God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even find yourselves fighting against God. So even though Gamaliel had never really, it doesn't look like there's evidence that he saw Jesus as the Messiah, um, you know, he was still speaking with some really godly wisdom. Um, the Jewish leadership had to admit they really didn't have a valid reason for really attacking this early growth of the church. And so this was the Gamaliel that, you know, Paul is talking about here that had been his um, teacher. I think it's very interesting to hear Paul give an account here of when he, you know, encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus and um, how the, the bright light just kind of knocked him down and how that the men with him heard something, but they didn't understand what was being said. And it says here that in verse 8, who are you, Lord? I asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus the Nazarene, the one you are persecuting. The people with me saw the light, but didn't understand the voice speaking to me. So they heard something and they'd seen the light, but they didn't, you know, hear or really understand what it was that Jesus was saying um, to Paul. Well, he was Saul at that time, but was saying to him at that time. So this whole message from Paul was really giving his testimony. Um, and at least the loudest ones in the crowd were really reacting badly when he mentioned the Gentiles. Let's go ahead now and actually read through verse 29. So this will be Acts 22, 24 through 29. So we want to remember Paul is standing on the stairs. He has been um, saved, you know, saved from the crowd by the Roman soldiers and they're taking him in, I guess just to try to figure out what's going on and to make sure that he's not just killed by the people out there. The commander brought Paul inside and ordered him lashed with whips to make him confess his crime. He wanted to find out why the crowd had become so furious. When they tied Paul down to lash him, Paul said to the officer standing there, is it legal for you to whip a Roman citizen who hasn't even been tried? When the officer heard this, he went to the commander and asked, what are you doing? This man is a Roman citizen. So the commander went over and asked Paul, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I certainly am, Paul replied. I am too, the commander muttered, and it cost me plenty. Paul answered, but I am a citizen by birth. The soldiers who were about to interrogate Paul quickly withdrew when they heard he was a Roman citizen, and the commander was frightened because he had ordered him bound and whipped. So that's as far as we'll go for today, but now he is... You know, the, the Romans just didn't know what had made everybody so angry. So they figured, well, if we beat him, maybe he'll he'll confess and we know what in the world he did wrong. Um, so that, you know, they, they were responsible to make sure that the that the, um, the Jewish crowd did not, did not do something that would get them in trouble with the Roman government. But they did need to try to find out what in the world was making um, Paul such a problem. Um, and then he speaks up. I'm a Roman citizen. And I love how the guy said, well, I am too. It cost me a bundle. You know, it cost me a bunch. 
And Paul said some very powerful words to him when he said, well, I was born a Roman citizen. That had a profound effect on them. They backed off because they, they were afraid they were going to get in trouble for even considering beating a Roman citizen like that. Just as we talked about last week, that it can be easy for people to be judged, you know, um, the, the enemy is just pushing the Jewish population that, that don't know Jesus, is just pushing them um, and misrepresenting things and getting them really, really riled up. Um, it's really interesting throughout Acts, you can see the believers, really Jesus' followers, trying to act as calmly as they can, trying to give rational answers, and um, the crowds just can sometimes act irrationally, even to the point where when we, when we go back to Ephesus when they were in that great big theater, that huge amphitheater, people didn't even know what they were angry about. They were just stirred up as a mob. The message of Jesus and what he did dying on the cross for us can just seem very, very foolish to those who don't know him can be, seem very foolish to the world. But when we know him and we know really what he's done, it's very reasonable. And really, if you look at the actions of the believers all through here, they are trying to be very rational, very reasonable, and they know that believing in Jesus is a reasonable thing. Um, this gospel is full of God's truth and wisdom and power and hope and forgiveness and salvation. But to those who don't know it, especially when the enemy is just driving them into anger, um, it can seem very foolish to them. You know, when I think about um, the whole crowd quieting down and God opening an opportunity for Paul to speak the truth for at least a period of time there to whose ever ears were going to be willing to receive it. Because, you know, sometimes a seed can be planted and it can take a while for it to start to grow. But in some of those lives out there, those words may have been the seed that started them on the journey of finding the truth. It reminds me of a time when I was working at a Cracker Barrel and um, Bill was in college and I was working waitressing there. And um, we were going to have a Christmas party. And it was nice, nice bunch of people, you know. Um, there were a few that I knew that I knew knew the Lord, but a lot of them there didn't, you know. And um, and if you know Cracker Barrels, you know that, that the wooden floors and everything, um, it's not a real muffled kind of a place, you know. The sound kind of rings in there because of all the wood and everything. And of course, I mean, I just dearly love Cracker Barrels. I think they're really fun. But anyway, we um, were having a party, and they asked if anybody would like to do something to share with others, you know, just something fun. And so um, one of the girls there who sang country western was setting herself up to sing some country western. We had other people just doing stuff for the crowd. And so you got to picture this is a, a, a bunch of people that are finally getting to really relax. They're having a party. The sound is echoey and it's, it's noisy in this room, really noisy. And um, the, the one girl had gone up and I was trying to sing and they could not get the sound system to work. It was making big, loud, weird noises and, and it was like distorted and it was hard to even really hear what she was doing and the crowd was raucous, you know. And so I had really, I had decided I wanted to share something. They had a, a piano there so I could play it and a, a microphone, you know, so they knew I'd be sharing something. I was one of the, the crowd, you know. And um, it was a song that I had written for Christmas, and um, it's actually on our song playlist. Um, it's called The Shadow of the Cross, and the whole song is talking about why did Jesus come? Of course, we were celebrating Christmas, and uh, it was a big change from everything else that had been going on in that room. And um, it just, you know, starts out saying, you know, that these, these um, wise men were led you know, a star was leading the wise men to find this, this child who would be the savior of the world. And what the world gained in that baby coming was going to be a great loss for his mother and even for God the Father because of the day that, that he would lay his life down for us. Because behind, it, behind that shining star, in that bright and shining star, there's a shadow of a cross. That's what Jesus came for. And um, so I just felt like I wanted to share that song and I could play it, you know, and everything. And uh, so the, the equipment was not working right. The mics were not working right. There's echo, bang, you know, laughter. So I went up and I said, well, Lord, <laughs> this is in your hands. 
So I sat down at the piano and they turned everything on and they, they made an announcement that I'd be the next one performing. And this has nothing to do with me. Um, this was not anything I did, but an absolute hush came over that room. I will never forget it. The echoing noise stopped. That is a hush over that room. And the sound system, the microphone worked perfectly. They could hear my piano. I took my keyboard in and my digital piano. And um, I just started playing it and the place just went silent. And so I was able to sing that entire song um, without any interruption. And when I got completely done and they nicely applauded for me because you know, they're being nice to everybody. The sound just boom back again. Everybody, everybody's talking and it's a whole sound just boom, got all back again. But God set those few minutes aside and it reminds me of, of this crowd becoming utterly silent and when they heard him speaking in Aramaic they became even more silent and it's like as soon as I started playing and began to sing it was complete silence in that, that nice echoey restaurant room and I thank God for that opportunity to maybe plant a seed into someone's life um, that that the Lord could bring about fruit in their life later where they could come to really know the Jesus that I was singing about. So that was pretty cool. So, well, we're going to see what happens now as, you know, Paul is with the Romans. We're going to go on now into chapter 23 next week and um, continue on into this journey as, as we're really starting to wrap up all that Luke was able to tell us about what happened during those early years of the church. So, alrighty, I'm grateful that God knows us and loves us. And we, just like we talked about last week, we wanna make sure that we really know what's going on in someone's life and that we've been willing to find out and that we show love and compassion and kindness. Absolutely. And I'm just glad that Paul calmly told him his testimony, even though a short time earlier, they'd been beating him. He loved them, and he wanted them to know his Jesus. Ah. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for your love. I thank you that all these words that Luke wrote, that Paul wrote, that John wrote, that Peter wrote, that so many different people were used by you to write these incredible words in our Bible that we can have today. So we know what happened and we know what you want and what your desires are for our life. Thank you for that. Give us a love for your word, Lord, just a love for it. So Lord, I just pray that you'll bring healing, that as we're coming into springtime, that things can start to just come back to life in all of our communities and, and that Lord, we can really reach out to each other and there can be laughter among friends and family that Lord that we can have reconciliation and forgiveness and find ways to bless others and Lord let us be a bold light that shines in the darkness because just like back in Paul's day we are constantly surrounded by people who need to know who you are oh Lord give us a testimony to share of your goodness in our life we won't have far to look, Lord, because you are so good. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. At the end of this video, on the end screen, there'll be an orange circle with arrows. Um, and there'll be a, a link in the description below to be able to go to um, the, uh, like, it's like the site where you can get a chance to see our live church service. And we do have special stuff coming up for Easter. So if you'd like to be able to share in, in the church service that we have, the worship and the, the word and everything, you know, the preaching, um, we'd love to have you join us. It's 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings, um, Eastern Standard Time. And then that service remains on YouTube after that. So um, we'd love to have you join us. Um, it's, it's fun to have the live interaction. So I just wanted to tell you about it if you'd be interested. Well, listen, I love you guys. And we're going to be getting into chapter 23 next week of Acts. So be blessed and um, appreciate you guys. Love you. Bye-bye.